Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. These are the texts for October 3rd, uh, 2021, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Genesis 2, 18 to 24. The semi-continuous Old Testament reading is uh, Job, uh, parts of chapters 1 and 2. The psalm is Psalm 8. The epistle is Hebrews uh, parts of chapters one and two, and the gospel is Mark 10, two through 16. What I'm sure every pastor, uh, every preacher wants to talk about, um, which is Jesus' hard saying about divorce. Yeah, so we mentioned uh, this last week uh, that we have four really challenging texts uh, in this last part of Mark before uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and in chapter 11 that are uh, these discipleship texts that are interspersed with the passion prediction. And so that contrast or that juxtaposition between uh, the the truth about discipleship and the truth about Jesus is is where we find ourselves. And we also mentioned last week, but it's worth mentioning again, and I say it uh, often when I'm doing preaching and talking about preaching uh, is that it's one of those texts that you simply cannot allow to be read uh, in the in in worship and then not preach on it uh, because there's just too many uh, people and ways in which divorce has touched uh, so many lives and uh, so it's if, if you read it you got to preach on it yeah and there's so much so much in it beyond just being, you know, quote unquote, the divorce text uh, mm-hmm. of the synoptic gospels. Um, you know, Paul as well appears to have um, seen divorce as incompatible with his understanding of marriage. It's, it's also a text about um, kind of what it means to be male and female. And in that culture, it's also a text about remarriage. It's also a text that construes marriage uh, in a heteronormative way. It's also a text that has to do with children and reminds us that a family isn't just about two spouses, but has a larger, um, Mm -hmm. uh, well, family uh, connected to it, but community as well. It's also a story about Jesus and the Pharisees and the way he interprets law. There's just a ton going on here. And to pair with Genesis 2 is not especially helpful because that's also one of those texts that has to be commented on, which we'll talk Mm -hmm. about in a minute. But um, it's again, it's, you know, whoever said that Jesus was about loosening restrictions wherever he went, uh, here's a place where he appears to make the law more constraining, I guess, is one way of, of putting it. Um, and again, we know this was a big topic in Jesus' day among Jews. It was a topic in some ways in the Roman world uh, where Jesus lived. The, the norms, the mores were a little bit different than they would have been like in one of Paul's cities. And so there's just a lot to consider um, taking this into account. And so it's pretty general. It's pretty blanket. Um, and so I'd say any preacher has got to help people negotiate, well, what does that look like in the messiness of, of, of real life um, and, and real hurt and real pains and things like that? So that's, and that's true with any kind of, kind of ethical prescription that we find in scripture. We need to dig down and say, what's going on here theologically? Uh, what's this trying to protect? What's this trying to guard against? Who's this trying to protect? I mean, those kinds of questions don't just need to be present in the sermon. I think that a, a preacher needs to kind of show a congregation how we work those out in our own um, kind of communal reckonings about about um, well issues like this. Well, and that's part of it. it that I mean, I think the word protection is really important, um, uh, particularly when it comes to the law and the interpretation of the law that, uh, and God's instruction, that the law was given for uh, the protection of the self and the protection of the community and for others and, and the flourishing of the self and the others. And so part of what's happening here is, uh, you know, is the undercurrent or the subterranean issue is uh, for what, what were, was the divorce happening? Uh, and, uh, and so if it's, you know, pretty much for anything you want, 
uh, and there's no constraints around there, then what, uh, then how is it that Jesus responds to that, uh, that reality and to say, no, this is you, that the act of divorce is, uh, is, is putting someone in jeopardy and not only you in jeopardy, but, you know, and it, it, as you said, the extended family in jeopardy, or it, it affects the whole family. So there is a sense of the way in which Jesus is speaking to, uh, speaking to the reality of, of, of divorce and for what reasons um, that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you guys have said, except one thing, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, that uh, we all know that uh, the, well, I think we all know, right, that the incredible cost harm to children uh, that can happen through divorce. It was, um, it was really interesting. Uh, I watch too much sports on TV, but one of the good things that happens when you watch too much of something is you get to, you'll find out human interest stories in the middle of them. And on ESPN, Kirk Herbstreet, who's recently written a memoir, talks about his own um, childhood in this uh, light. Uh, that's worth, if, if you are a sports um, addict like I am, it, you, you could look that up. But um, also the number one cause of new poverty in the United States is uh, divorce. Um, so that this is a justice issue for Jesus. Uh, that is who is harmed by this way. So that new poverty, meaning somebody is living above poverty, uh, above the poverty line, and then they fall below it. The, the number one uh, reason for that is divorce. The number two reason for that is um, catastrophic health uh, um, issue with no insurance when someone has no insurance. And so those, I mean, to put those two things together, uh, and think about, um, to think about this passage in the larger issue of, of justice. Uh, I, I, I do want to emphasize again, what Caroline said, uh, which is, um, if this text is going to be read, uh, it has to be commented on in some way. Um, we had, uh, or switch it out. If you're not going to do it, if, if you're doing a series on something else, you know, within, for instance, Job, we'll talk about that shortly. Think about, um, or uh, Hebrews. Sub, yep. Think about, uh, um, sub, subbing something out, uh, in, in its place. I'd say too, if you're preaching on this and, and you find it's hard to kind of break out of a particular perspective, it's good to ask around. You might want to spend some time um, poking around your congregation, talking to people who, uh, who you know to have really good marriages from as far as you can tell, people that you think have gone through uh, rocky times, or to talk to divorced people or children of divorced uh, parents. Um, uh, you know, we have our stories to tell that can help a preacher appreciate the ways in which um, uh, well, this is somebody, something somebody said to me in the process of my own divorce, which was no two divorces are ever the same, right? They've all, each got their own individual uh, stories to be told. And not that those have to get re-aired, but just to kind of point out the way in which when we do ethical deliberation, when we talk about who's hurting in the congregation, that we just, we talk about all the ways in which we're really good at hiding that in our institutions, but also the ways in which we're really good at making assumptions about what must be good for somebody else has to be what's good for me and vice versa. And, um, I think we all know that as preachers in our own ways, but because this text is so absolute, because there's no story of uh, Jesus and his remarried disciple who actually is, is a lot happier now than he, you know, whatever. There's, there's no story of, of, of confession and restoration that's tagged onto this, but we all know those stories in our own lives. Yeah, and I think too, if uh, the if you as the preacher have been uh, have been touched by divorce in some way, I think uh, to give yourself some space to reflect on that or grieve grieve that. I when when we were preparing to podcast, I realized that the last time this text uh, we had this text was three years ago, and I was very recently divorced uh, about three, four months and not, and, and so I was wondering how I would feel 
when this text came around, uh, realizing that we were podcasting on it. And that was important to just kind of sit with, where am I three years, three years later, uh, three, three plus years later? Um, I'm also a child of divorce. My parents divorced um, when I was in college. And, and so, and I've, um, in the last three years, I've walked alongside a number of, of friends who have been divorced. And so just to give yourself some space to sit with that, not uh, kind of uh, maybe, um, uh, maybe set aside the, the, the theoretical and the theological and the, and the homiletical and just kind of um, sit with the personal a little bit uh, so that you can preach this text with, uh, with a kind of honesty and integrity that, uh, that, that will be so important when, you're, when you are speaking about um, something like this from the pulpit. I might have missed it, but Rolf, were you going to disagree with something or push back? In a moment, but let's talk about the ending of the text first. Um, for instance, you could just start the text at verse 13 if you're not going to uh, talk about, if you don't want to address divorce, about the little children, uh, bringing the little children uh, to him and Jesus laying his hands on them and blessing them. Um, this is often, uh, I think this text is often sort of romanticized in our culture about let the little children come to me. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing um, that, you know, that a text like this, that we have uh, in the ancient world, uh, in the Hellenistic world, uh, Matt and Caroline, how were children regarded in general? They're almost oh, non- Non-people. Social, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. From the larger society. I mean, doesn't mean their parents didn't love them, but <laughs> mm -hmm. didn't really have rights mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the way yeah. we think of rights today as a kind of innate thing well and a really kind of powerlessness and so that i mean that that's one of the uh, important aspects of this text uh, or this part of the text with regard to the larger themes of of the whole of this last portion of mark but but just the realities of divorce is who's who are the who has the power and who doesn't uh, in in that situation, who and who is who then whose powerlessness is even more exacerbated by that, and and if, and to recognize that Jesus has talked about this already back in chapter nine, thirty six and thirty seven. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking his arms, he said to them, "Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me." And so that. That and, and yet, and yet in a couple of weeks, we're going to get uh, the request of James and John for power, and mm -hmm. so that's a that's a that's another theme that is that's playing out here is the the desire for power, but what uh, and where but where does that then uh, where does that leave uh, the other in that act of power? Thanks. I think that um, one of the things that we need to do is teach parents how to bless their children. Um, and so at the last church where I was uh, on staff as pastor, uh, we tried to equip all the families to, to bless their children every day and with, uh, with a simple action. Anytime you can uh, pair a spiritual practice with the text and teach it and equip people, that's a good thing. And so um, the one we used was uh, encouraging parents just to make the sign of the cross on their children's forehead and to say simply, Jesus loves you and so do I, uh, mm -hmm. and to do that on a daily basis. There's more complicated uh, blessings that can be taught, but that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. So here's where I was going to disagree. I actually, uh, Matt, think uh, the pairing with Genesis 2 is brilliant, and I love it. I love it for a couple of reasons. First of all, Genesis 2 is a hilarious text. Um, uh, it's a hilarious text, right? So all through Genesis 1, it is good. And God saw that it's good. And goodness in Genesis 1 is always mutual. It's whenever there's a pairing or, or a threefold triad that's in, in shalom, in balance, that's when things are good. They're not inherently good, but they are relationally good. And then you get to Genesis 2 and God says, it is not good. And it's not good, aloneness. Um, and so... God brings all the animals of the field uh, to see, is this going to be a good partner for the man? You know, and this is a great 
to act out, right? You know, uh, to act out in the children's sermon or act out with the kids, you know, and it said, moo, right? Is this a good partner? Nope. And it's not until there's another human being that then the man uh, finds, and, and this is a Hebrew idiom. So the, the little ideological story about uh, is built on the idiom, this at last is a bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. That means in our language, this is the ticket, right? This is, this is cash money. So this is the one, and it's another human being. Uh, and so I think it's a great passage, one, because it's hilarious. And second of all, theologically, though, um, the, God's building block for society the, is um, not the individual, which is sort of what it is in Western civilization, for good or ill. God's building block uh, for society is the family and, not, um, and, and the multi-generational family, uh, the household uh, in Hebrew uh, that you see. And, and one good thing to remind people of that is that the, uh, the building block for God's society, for all societies that God has is the family, but there's not just one way families can be formed. There's many, family has looked differently, has looked differently in many, in every age. So that's one, I, I do think that's one problem is we have this vision of the two generation family with, you know, Ward and June and two kids and a pet. Yes. In my case, a cat. A cat. Bandit. Bandit. So, uh, yeah, and they, you know, the commentary does a good job of, of, of recognizing the ways in which this passage needs to be handled with care as a proof text to uh, condemn family structures, as she says, that stray from male dominance, female submissiveness, or heterosexual pairing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I, I think, what, you know, one thing that you said, um, Rolf, is really important is this which, uh, you know, one of the words that I always come back to, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago of the, the helper, you know, the NRSV, the helper, uh, which can be construed as a submissive kind of uh, term when in fact it's this fitting partner or, and then it typically refers to God. And so what, what at the heart of this, and really at the heart of the Mark text too, I think is, is and what you were saying of the critique of individualism it's it's it, yes it's the household yes it's community but it's also our absolute need for companionship uh, and and who are the who who are who is our fa our family <laughs> that uh, those persons whether it be an individual a, you know a spouse or a partner uh, that are that, that fill that deep, deep desire for companionship. Uh, and and that that's, that's one of the things that we grieve then when in a, in a divorce or, or a family separation is, is that loss of compa companionship and then having to reconstruct what that looks like. Or people will talk about, you know, you're my, you're my family of choice, right? When those family structures haven't, haven't lived up to the kind of expectations. Um, and, and that might be still, that might be something that really resonates with people, especially when that companionship has been deeply challenged over the last 18 plus months with, uh, with COVID and the pandemic and our usual ways of maintaining companionship have been, uh, have been challenged. So I, I, I think that's an important aspect of this text as well. I think it's still a hard text. It, oh, I didn't I'm say not, it wasn't I'm a hard not, text, but I'm I absolutely it, agree. That's a lot of that. I appreciate the way, Rolf, you're trying to point out the humor in it, which is true. And of course, it's it's been misread and misused yeah. sometimes oh, by yeah. the authors. I mean, what Paul does with this in in First Corinthians 11 is a, a little fortunate. Um, yes, unfortunate is a good word. Uh, but I think also, and this is in the commentary too, to help people understand, why do we understand Ha'adam to be male? I know that's ambiguous and nobody's quite sure about what to do with that, right? But what, what do we understand Adam to be in this? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, it, but, I, I, I think the commentary does a great job dealing with the translation issues, especially. And um, the argument, I think Phyllis Tribble's uh, the original, uh, the originator of the argument that gender is not created until uh, that there is uh, 
male and female. Before that, in the story, it's the human, uh, mm -hmm. a sort of uh, generic, genderless. And uh, I think that's a helpful argument. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about things get easier now, don't they? Job. Oh yeah. Yeah. So consider We've got four weeks on Job. Job consider right? four weeks on Job. Um, the, or not. The, the lectionary does a pretty good job of if of essentially if you're going to do four weeks um this is a pretty good way to divide it up uh to be honest um although it would have been nice to have a week that deals with job's friends um they're they're cut out of the story really here which is that's again unfortunate but still it's not bad um so if you're going to do it this is the week to set it up and as uh, one of my friends many years ago um, started a sermon on Job this way, and the only reason I know it is because one of his parishioners talked to me that week and talked about what a powerful sermon uh, she had heard. And this was a woman whose uh, oldest daughter had died suddenly at age 34 from a brain aneurysm. And that suffering um, is always with her. And um, the sermon started out, what if, you know, uh, you lost everything, and then someone told you it was your fault. Because that's essentially how a lot of society deals with tragedy, is to blame the one who has just been victimized by some sort of tragedy. Um, and to find some way, theologically, nutritionally, medically, socially, to, to say, see, it's your fault. Uh, and um, that's a good way to enter I think this story, um, but we can come back uh, in in later weeks uh, to talk about this. But um, if you're going to preach for four weeks on Job, this is the week you set it up, and you set it up in some way like that. Yeah, I, I think you're right that you 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 either commit to all four or you do none at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. and I think so too. you don't need to necessarily summarize the entire story but how to contextualize it like you just did job's story and all of the weirdness and all of the kind of outlandishness of the severity of the suffering and then the the, the magnitude of the restoration at the end let's put that aside for a minute and talk about um everybody knows somebody who's got a story to tell like what you just described um yeah and everybody's thought of a time when the easiest solution from our point of view has been to blame the victim or to kind of just throw your arms up in the air or just you know be satisfied with really lame answers for um, these kinds of problems. Uh, and so to invite people into this, so Job's questions are humanity's questions in so many ways. And, and, the, and, and not to set up Job at the beginning as somehow promising an answer. <laughs> <laughs> or suggesting that by the time we get done in four weeks, you'll know <laughs> you'll well, have it, solutions because I don't think the book works that way, and that's part of its beauty. Well, that that's it. It's 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 how do we how do we um, sit in the unanswerable, and we try to fill that space, and we have we come up with answers, or we say that say things to help you know to help what we think are helping to make it better, and uh, and there's something quite. Uh, well, very theological about that. Uh, the ways in which a lot of how we go about theology is, is wanting to have answers or prescribing certain ways that God works or we think the way God works. And what if you spend yeah, four, four Sundays just living in a, a kind of a theological place that recognizes that doesn't, that's not how it works when it comes to God. Yeah, I think the book of Job, uh, it's about many, many things. Um, but two things it's about that people don't often talk about is um, how do how do we how do we deal with our own suffering, and how do we respond to others the suffering of others, and um, so that's one reason to draw in Job's friends' response because at first they do the absolute right thing, and this is um, this is how I teach people uh, how to basic pastoral care, which is you go. You go over to see your friend who is suffering. And this is to set up something that's going to happen in week four. They go to comfort him. Uh, and the word, uh, the root for comfort in Hebrew is nacham. Going to come back to that in three weeks. And uh, they go to comfort Job. And 
this is the first thing that people have to learn to do because the suffering of others, uh, if we have our emotions of our own, repels us. We don't want to. We don't want to go to be around someone who's in extreme emotional suffering. Um, other people's suffering is very difficult to be around. And so what you have to do is just go anyway. And no one will remember what you wore, what you said, unless you say something really stupid. But if you just go and don't say anything that will fix it because you can't fix it, but just go. And that's the best uh, advice about how to deal with the suffering of others. As I like to say, and bring Cheetos. Oh, bring some sort of food. I love Cheetos. I uh, Cheetos oh are the perfect food as long gosh. as nutrition is not important to you. They are so good. Right. The, exactly. the crunchy ones, not the, well, I like the puffed ones, but the crunchy ones. Not the spicy ones. No, no, not the super spicy hot ones. No, yeah. the flaming, the flaming Cheetos, but oh, they're so good. Mm. So uh, Psalm 8 is really paired with the Genesis 2. And I've talked about Psalm 8 on this podcast, I don't know how many times, uh, because it, it comes up a lot. It's one of the happiest, shortest Psalms. And so uh, they love to use it. Uh, but this is really, again, a Psalm. It's a creation Psalm. It's a hymn. And it's a Psalm about the place of humanity in creation. At the center of the Psalm is a question. So it starts and ends with the same refrain, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. By the way, here is the my cat just jumped up. Uh, on my desk, speaking of uh, two kids and a cat. But so at the center of the psalm is this question um, that, that people have, which is, it should say, what is a human being that you are mindful of that one or a mortal that you care for that one? It's an individual quest about why should I think God knows or cares about me? And the psalm's answer is, because God has given you meaningful work to do. And uh, so it's a psalm about vocation and, and uh, finding one's purpose in terms of being a servant. Oh, it's about so many other things, but that's enough for today, for me. You it's all... also paired nicely with Hebrews 2, if we're ready to move to Hebrews 2. I'd love yeah. to move to Hebrews 2. Where it's, We've uh, got, oh, go ahead. No, you go. Uh, well, no, just to say that, okay, now we've got uh, potentially seven, uh, seven readings from Hebrews. That is if you are not a Reformation or All Saints preacher. So it's five if you are uh, in inclined that way, but seven if you do not preach on Reformation or All Saints. So we've got seven readings from Hebrews. So I just wanted to point that out before we jump right into the text, which people already probably knew, but you know. But you the text makes the text doesn't make sense unless you retranslate Psalm eight in the singular. Mm. You mean because it's a text about Jesus mm -hmm. being the Son of Man, which is what um, the phrase "mortal" is literally in Hebrew, a Son of Man. Got it. If you're kicking off Hebrews, it's good to know that just how strange this book is in so many ways. It has a theological outlook that's, that's unique within the New Testament. Big questions about when it was written to whom and why. It's the word Hebrews never appears in the book. It was just assumed in the, uh, in the early church that this must have been addressed to what we would call Jewish Christians. That's not even totally clear. The word temple never appears, but it's deeply invested in this notion of Jesus as a high priest. Um, it spends a lot of time with Psalm 110.4 that talks about that. We'll come back to that in coming weeks. Melchizedek. Yeah, we'll get a little Melchizedek action. But it's also the, a book uh, that, that I think, well, it's, how about this, one of the top three that does the most to advance what we would call today the incarnation, which is not necessarily worked out in its full form in the first century. But it, it does talk about Jesus as, as divine here, right? The reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. You see maybe some stoic influence on the book here, but it's also, but he's one of us. And this is where the, the, the book will keep coming back to this. It will keep insisting on Jesus' supremacy in all things. 
superior priest, superior sacrifice, superior mediator, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but he's also one of us. And that will come out a little bit more in some future readings. But even here, and this is our, our friend and colleague, Craig Kester, talks about this in chapter two, verse nine, this, but we do see Jesus who for a little while was made lower than the angels, that, that part of what's going on in Hebrews is this testimony to having experienced Jesus, not as some ethereal idea or some concept of divinity, but as having come in real flesh. And that's deeply important to this book. So it's a book that seems to elevate Jesus all the time and almost makes him kind of more of an emblem than a human being. But every now and then look for these places where uh, the flesh and bloodness, so to say, of our savior uh, comes out uh, um, really clearly in this book. It's really important to its theology that we recognize that we are like him and he's like us. Well, and to the Christology of the book. And so that those first, the, the, those, if you take apart those first four verses uh, and what is actually being said about Jesus and then to say, yep, yeah, but we've experienced Jesus in the flesh, that even lifts up the, the, you know, the extraordinariness of the incarnation even more. So Jesus is heir of all things, agency through which God created the world, the radiant light of God's glory, the representation of God, the one who sustains all creation, uh, makes purification, purification for sins, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God. I mean, you just have this, you could get stuck there in that, what, you know, what often is called this high Christology. Uh, and yet, and yet that's what we get. That's, it's, it's high in Jesus, this, that we see that, that isn't that amazing that in the flesh we are experiencing all of this and so the the incarnation has to be held too with this this remarkable reality of of what god has done in jesus